Hi there! Welcome to, at least for now, the last video of my Addictive Synthesis MedSynth video series. In this video, I'm gonna do a quick run-up of the entire project, you know, from the beginning until, you know, the last days of my, you know, design and assembly and, you know, presenting this synth and becoming an engineer with this being my last project as a student. I'm gonna review each and every video show you every source you probably need, including notebooks, videos and tutorials. And after, you know, a review of every single step in this project, I'm gonna present you solutions to the stuff I did not solve with this specific design. And at least for now, I will finish the MedSynth project. Maybe in the future we have a MedSynth 2.0. Who knows? Ideas, suggestions and, you know, any critiques are very welcome. Go to the comments down below to, you know, let me know what you think about the project and let's get started. So first of all, I'd like to thank, you know, Subreddit, Do It Yourself, Thinksizer and Embedded Systems. You know, I asked for a lot of help and I try to give back to the community every now and then. Secondly, I'd like to thank, you know, personally, Marcel Johan, my mentor, he helped me a lot and this project will not be without his help. And lastly, I'd like to thank, personally, Bob Miller. I asked for his help many years ago and through a series of, you know, emails, uh, he helped me with a lot of suggestions and he was really helpful. Give me the little push, you know, to motivate me and let me know that I had someone to help me with the project, with ideas, and his project was, you know, the one to push me forward to make my own synthesizer. So thank you subreddits, my mentor and Bob Miller. Thank you so much. If you guys want an external source, you know, beyond this video series about audio with ESP32, this video here is a must. Please check Andreas Pius for a lot of ESP32 related projects. And of course, maybe you don't know this, my GitHub repository is available to everyone. Although I must warn you, this project in specific was made in college in a rush, so the code is nasty, especially the AVR one, the one that I use for the human interface, you know? I try to focus on hardware, and although this project had a lot of software in it, it was really low level, so I was basically emulating a hardware into the firmware of the SP32, and as a guy who, you know, does not practice code a lot, the code here gets weird especially on the AVR side. So if you're gonna co copy something, please pay attention that this code works. As far as I know, do not crash or bug in any way, but it looks terrible. So yeah, it was a college project nonetheless. And if one day I get to make MedSynth 2.0, I'll probably rework everything here and make a new repository. So keep an eye for that. Well, better show you than just tell, you know? I don't know why I just forgot to turn the screen on. Here's the GitHub that you probably need to, if you want to use this project as a source, to learn how to make a DDS engine yourself. This is Bob Miller's video that inspired me to make my own synthesizer. Although my, my project don't get close to what he did in his, but anyway, thank you Bob again for the emails. I'll probably send you the link for this video after I finish recording and editing all that. So thank you Bob again. And my video series started with the first video, video number zero, of course. So in this episode, I basically do an introduction to the project, as the title says. At this point right here, I had something already worked on, but I started to make the, the vlog, you know, to record everything. Gotta tell you, it's weird to watch this, this video because this is almost two, two years ago now, and I learned a lot about, you know, DDS systems and synthesis itself. I learned a lot about programming and hardware, so one might cringe looking at his past endeavors, but remember, it's all, you know, a path to knowledge and learning, so I, I kind of appreciate watching these videos, you know, two years after I made them. After doing an introduction, then I talk about the deep node and the theory behind DDS systems. After that, I talk about the main reason I you know, finishing this project as it is right now, the keyboard and, you know, reworking and making it, you know, function as you try to make it work again because you're usually using old keyboards. 
I was playing this later, but the bad context related to, you know, the aging and oxidation of this context is the reason I'm finishing the Medicines 1.0 as it is. Then I teach you the basics, you know, about reading a keyboard and making an interface with the user, then building the other parts about, you know, using both cores, and then the basics of the audio engine using both cores on VSP32. And then the last video on the series more than a year ago, no, December 4th, 2021, episode 5, and I was really tired of the semester. I, I didn't know better. I'll be much more tired, you know, in the year to come. 2022 was not an easy year. And here in the comments, I post that I need to make a video about how to connect the PCM 5102A DAC. And after that, all I was missing from the series is to show, you know, the progress of building, you know, the harder parts and putting everything to work. So let's do that. So the first thing I did to make this I2S module work was to change the way the I2S, you know, library work for the SP32. So as I was testing the I2S protocol, I'm going to show the module a little bit after this. I realized there was a lot of overheads when writing to the I2S. So I actually edited the I2S library for the SP32. And basically what I did was just change one function. Now, you must be thinking, why didn't you just do something something better than just this? I, I'm not a programming guy and I just did the easiest. And here it is, the I2S write function. I basically commented these checks and the semaphore because I have only one function that I'm gonna call that is my interrupt, you know, the interrupt that's gonna write 40,000 times per second to the I2S protocol in order to access the output of the DAC. And after disabling this, I commented the log because again, why would I need this? And I used this function instead of using the standard I2S library. And after that, I created my own library to access the DAC I do it in it, so I configure the DMA here and I make it really big because I have a lot of memory in the SP32. I make it master, sample rate is 40,000. You need to make this exactly the same, you know, the frequency you have for the init for the, your I2S. The function is going to configure the DMA. It needs to be perfectly in sync with the interrupt, otherwise, you know, it's going to screw it up. Then I configure the pins, you know install the driver and the output is this little function here receive both you know, both bytes and then use my custom function for i2s write that's everything i need to to use in my 40000 kilohertz interrupt so that's all you need to know about my dac you know how to make the pcm 5102 alpha in order to make it work with dsp32 for now there's no schematics but i'm making the schematics here and i'll probably be up in the GitHub itself uh, after I edit and post this video. So now let me just show you, you know, the, the case I used for, you know, the old keyboard and, and the case, how I made the acrylic panel and assemble everything. And then you have the back end of the circuit in order to read and make everything available. In this part of the video, I want to thank a great friend of mine that helped me a lot, you know, in order to make all the cuts necessary to use this old case to match the keyboard and my acrylic panel. So, Dirceu, thank you very much, man. I've been friends with this Dirceu for 15 years and he's going through some tough shit right now and... I want to express my gratitude for everything you did for me. Thank you very much. So this is the case after Dirceu helped me a lot to cut this. So I made uh, an opening for the panel. I extended the keyboard part in order to, for this bigger keyboard to fit. And I cut the side there to make... I had the idea now, it worked really well. So the, the, the idea was to put the SP outside in order you know, to look at the engine working. Then you have the back part. This is the old keyboard, you know, the case before all the cuts. You know, have the original part there, the original part here, everything here. Before we sanded it, you know, and then cut everything and then I painted everything. This is afterwards, you know, this is after I 
cut and sanded and painted, so it looks really nice. A lot of you may be thinking, why did you just try a really good case? Because I did it and I needed to become an engineer. So this is with the acrylic panel I designed for, you know, I designed the big square, but I had it, you know, I actually had it made, you know, so I, I just sent the parameters in order to fit, you know, my big ass display, 40 by 2 LCD, if I'm not mistaken, the five pots, and then the part for the user inputs, you know, buttons and, and the digital encoder. This is, you know, me working in our first apartment, you know, the apartment before this one. And this is me trying to paint that part. I made a board, then soldered everything, tested everything, and then put it in, on, on, in the back part of the acrylic panel and inserted hot glue to make, you know, a nice finish. I did not want the user to see the hot glue, so I started, I tried to paint it more than once. You know, it didn't work. This is me. Just accepting that paint would not be a great idea. Uh, in the end, I went with a paintless design. It worked flawlessly. This is me soldering stuff. And this is me working on the keyboard part. This is an old picture I just wanted to include in here. So this is the back part of the panel. You see a little bit of paint in there. And this is the back of the display and the back of the pots. They fit really neatly here, not much wiggle room. And after that, those parts are installed, I got the two main boards, you know, the board that I use to read the keyboard and the board that, you know, uses the board at a peripheral together with the display and the pots and everything and connects everything to the AT Mega. My video series were rolling with this already, but I haven't shown you pictures, so there you go. This is me getting really close to, you know, finishing the project. I have an LED and a pot for brightness for the display. Power supply is connected already. And you have here this old phone supply, I think, you know. Then this is the final product. You have all the mess from before, and it's a lot of things. And then they connect, let me see this. You have the power supply here, the pots, the pots connect to the main board, the interface board. Then the keyboard uh, board, then the display, all three connect to the main board here, including the pots, then you have the connection for the serial, you know, and you have the board with the wires that come from the, the band, you know, the band wheel, and the RXTX and power supply that goes to the ESP32 and the DAC. It's a lot to unpack here. In it's a hot glue mess, but it works. Worked, at least. You know why it stopped working. And this is the final product. This is the final result. I have this, this picture even on Instagram because I was really proud of it. And the product was fully functional here. And this is days before I presented to the, the you know, my mentor and for evaluation. You know, that day I became an engineer. Practically. I needed the ceremony, you know, still, but. So using my GitHub here as my repository as a source, just to recap, you know, th this project is not small. Uh, I have a keypad connected to a DMUX MUX, so it's the, it's the keyboard board. And then you have the UI buttons and the encoder. You have the 40 by 40 by 4 LCD screen and the band stick and sliders all connect to the AT Mega 2560. And the AT Mega connects using UART to the SP32, telling the SP32 everything the user is doing, you know, changing a parameter, changing a variable from the internal VCO, internal VCF, whatever, and if I'm pressing any keys, you know. And then the SP32 using I2S connects the PCM5102 Alpha in order to make sounds. Uh, unfortunately, the PCM5102 does not have an amplifier, so I used headphones to listen to it. And when I presented the, the, my, you know, made my final presentation for my grad work, I had to use my microphone interface to get, capture the sounds. I think I have that in video. I'll probably make it available. No, no. So, unfortunately, a disaster happened. After I presented this, I was exhausted. And if I'm not mistaken, a week later I presented my grad work, I still haven't received, you know, my diploma, this was like a month before the ceremony, I got a job as an engineer and then I moved and then my life became 
simpler but yet more complicated. You know, we have a lot of problems with the new apartment, the apartment we, we are in right now. Months later I tried testing this synthesizer and it didn't work. Let me show you the synthesizer. No, I, I, I don't think I, I show you. So, uh, let me fit in here. This is the mad synth. So let's begin for the least important part. This is the back of the synthesizer and all the way here you have the power connector and this was installed with a lot of hot glue and using some composite material, you know, homemade. Then the power switch, we have a slot in here, then the acrylic panel. And you can see the acrylic panel shines in the pots and the display, but in here, have the hot glue part with the buttons and encoder for me. Another sloth, then the keyboard and the ESP32 and the DAC with some probes for testing and debug. This is the result of many many months of work and you know now it's going to Madrigo Underground Museum you know alongside my previous projects. This project, of course, did not begin with this prototype, and let me show you. Here on my report story, I made you know this histogram, you know, with using pictures. Everything started with my microcontroller class, and I made a sample-based signal generator, and it had a lot of cool features. I will post a video in post edit here. You could change the resolution, you know, the bit depth. Of the of the sampling and the sample rate had many lookup tables inside of it. It was really sophisticated in the end. Then I had a class called computers and music, and I made this little guy here that you know it kind of kind of simulated the deep notes. Then the third version was a lot of small prototypes that I soldered and desoldered. Then I have the making embedded systems course. And I made another synthesizer. It's kind of similar to the first one, but it was using an ARM, very powerful ARM core here. And you have the fifth version, you know, this version that I just showed you. So, what is left for Mad Synth? Well, for now, as I told you, I had bad contacts, you know, you kind of rework the keyboard to work. Uh, for some time, you know, you make the contacts, you know, have a better conductivity and use, I used a conductive paint for that, but in the end, you know, I don't know if oxidation or I don't know what happened, the keyboard barely works, you know, the, the keyboard part barely works. The synthesis and the interface works flawlessly, you know, have a internal VCO, internal filter, internal ADS envelope generator, you can use parameters for each and every internal software module to control any other module. It's really complicated, hence why the code is just a big mess. But I'm gonna finish it here because refurbishing an old keyboard is a lot of work. And if I happen to make uh, a second installment of this franchise, you know, the MedSynth 2.0, I'll probably go into MIDI because if there was a lesson I learned here making this module, especially this part right here, was that MIDI makes a lot of sense, you know, for this part right here. Because you can abstract a lot of problems of the synthesis, sound synthesis world, that is, the interface with the user. And you can abstract that and focus on this part here, the DDS engine and the codec. So, if one day I made MedSynth 2.0, what it will be like? Well, first of all, I'm gonna optimize it because the DDS code is very generalistic, you know? It was made for my academic, for academic purposes and I programmed it, you know, together with the interface codes and I was in a rush, so there's a lot of room for optimization, especially the use of cores, you know? I'm using one core for just the serial processing and another for the interrupt. One thing I could do is just 
make the, this interrupt a little bit shorter and more optimized and run together with the serial function in the first core that leaves us you know with an entire core that could be used for effects like a reverb a reverb uses a lot of memory and a lot of processing power so that's the the first idea for the next gen of the synthesizer the next idea is just to cram another esp32 there you know using i square s inputs and outputs you can use many consecutive modules you know then you can of course think of a Tinsy or another you know arm based mcu so that's basically the future for this project because i learned a lot you know i gather a lot of, of bibliography and a lot of knowledge that i try to put available on the internet through these videos everything that i can link to you will be in the description so you can you know work on your own project and if i go back i try to make it midi so i just focus on the small module maybe 3d print a case with some pots and buttons and then the keyboard part and everything there it just be used you know i'll buy a midi keyboard a really good one new one and bad contact will not be a problem no more so guys Thanks for coming, you know, uh, I hope you learned something, I learned this project taught you something. And I know this video series are not a tutorial, they're more like a log of everything I did. And if you have any any doubts, any questions, I'll be happy, you know, to, to answer you. Yesterday a guy contacted me on LinkedIn about this project and, you know, I, I'm happy to help, you know. If there was any doubt on how, how to make your own software DDS system, I'll probably make you know a tutorial dedicated to it, but I think the videos I made are, are good enough, at least for a start. I am Ed Rigo, thanks for coming for my underground archives, and I will see you in the next video, and possibly in the next project. Bye bye!